Uh, good evening, good morning if you're watching online uh, or out in BLT. My name is Kelly. I'm one of the pastors here at Deepwater, and we are in the middle of a series called Pentecost Prayer. We're talking about prayer, we're talking about the Holy Spirit and how God works in our lives. And um, I, I just want to kind of recap last week because I'm going to kind of just just play off of, talk about, continue what we were talking about last week. So we talked last week about how God is a consuming fire and how the more we encounter God's love, the more that we are consumed by him and his love, uh, that we're changed. We aren't, we aren't the same. We are consumed with love for him in return, and our encounters with God um, leave us forever changed. And things sometimes when we spend that time with God, when we encounter his love, things that felt before like they were very satisfying or very fulfilling start to seem unfulfilling. They start to seem unimportant. They start to sometimes even seem distasteful. We are fundamentally changed when we encounter God's love, his consuming fire. We are made holy as God himself is holy. We are refined. Refining is always the result of consuming. God, his spirit in us, his Holy Spirit, is a refining fire. And that's where we're going to camp out today. We're going to take a look at the 12th chapter of Hebrews, and we're going to work our way kind of backwards through the chapter. I don't know if that's a good thing to do or not, but I'm doing it. Uh, So we're going to start at verse 18. If you want to follow along, if you've got a Bible, you can, and the verses will be up behind me on the screen. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18. You have not come to a physical mountain, to a place of flaming fire, of darkness, of gloom, and of whirlwind, as the Israelites did at Mount Sinai. For they heard an awesome trumpet blast and a voice so terrible that they begged God to stop speaking. They staggered back under God's command, if even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. Moses himself was so frightened at this sight that he said, I am terrified and trembling. No, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to countless thousands of angels in a joyful gathering. You have come to the assembly of God's firstborn children whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God himself who is justice over all things. You have come to the spirits of the righteous ones who have been made perfect. You have come to Jesus, the one who mediates the new covenant between God and his people, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks of forgiveness instead of crying out for vengeance, like the blood of Abel. Since we're receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. For our God is a devouring fire. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, that you reveal yourself to us through it. And Lord, I pray that as we listen to you this evening, as we listen to you this morning, God, that we would hear you, that we would be open to what you have to say to us, and that we would leave closer to you than we were when we came. In your name we pray. Amen. The first thing that it's important to understand and we see here in this verse, um, these verses, before we get into the nitty-gritty of of how God changes us and what his refining fire looks like, is that we don't get to define what holiness looks like. The author of Hebrews here is referencing Exodus chapter 20 where God gives Moses the Ten Commandments and he comes down on the mountain in smoke and thunder and lightning and he's making a connection for his readers who were Hebrew believers, his readers between the old covenant, the old way that God related to his people and the new covenant the new way that God relates to his people through Jesus. And this passage reminds us that we, the church, haven't come necessarily to the same experience that the Israelites had when they came before the presence of the Lord, but that we have come to the same God, the same God who shook the mountains, who was so incredible and so overwhelming that his people begged him to stop talking to them. That is the same spirit of God that lives in us. We can come to him directly. Our experience is different because we've come through Jesus who mediates the new covenant between God and his people. But we come to the same God. I think that sometimes we like to separate 
God in the Old Testament and God in the New Testament. God who in the Old Testament who got angry at sin and he rained down fire and he came in fire and smoke and thunder and lightning and his people were terrified of him. And we like to keep that apart from Jesus in the New Testament who loved people and hugged children and healed sick people and the Holy Spirit who guides us and who helps us. And we like to keep those two kind of ideas of God apart. You have the Old Testament God and then we have, I think sometimes we think like the new and improved God 2.0 and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. But they aren't new and improved. They aren't the new and improved God of the Old Testament. They are the God of the Old Testament. The whole of God is revealed in the whole of Scripture. The Spirit of God, the same Spirit of God that was on the mountain in the Old Testament is the Spirit of God that lives in the hearts of believers. And he wants us to be holy as he is holy. He gets to define what that holiness is because he is the Holy One. He does not fit into a mold. He won't conform to your agenda. He's not a genie that you can just rub his lamp three times and then pop him out and he'll help you with your problems and then tuck him discreetly back in your pocket until you need him again. You don't get to define him. You don't get to define what his holiness looks like. In scripture, God says over and over again, we heard it last week, be holy as I am holy. He doesn't say be as holy as you want to be or be as holy as you feel like being or be as holy is as comfortable. He says be holy as I am holy. When we are consumed by God, by his devouring fire, we are made holy as he is holy. God has revealed in the whole of scripture. I was listening to an old sermon of Tim Keller's last week, and he's, he tells a story of kind of a pivotal moment in his life. He was listening to a sermon by a lady named Barbara Boyd, and she says this. She says, if you want to invite me into your house, and you say, come in, Barbara, stay out, Boyd, I wouldn't know what to do because I'm Barbara Boyd. She says, she couldn't, I couldn't even say, you know, this half is, is Barbara and this half is Boyd, so I'll just bring this half in and leave this half out. She said, you either get all of me or you get neither of me. Now, if you say, I'd like the loving Jesus, the helping Jesus, I'd like the holy Jesus, the powerful Jesus, the Jesus who is great, the Jesus who, who, is, who is loving, but you say, I don't want the Jesus who convicts of me of sin. I don't want the holy Jesus. I don't want the powerful Jesus then you get no Jesus at all. She says, think about it for a minute. If the distance between the earth and the sun, those 96 million miles, was the thickness of a piece of paper, then the distance from the earth to the next nearest star would be a stack of paper 76 feet high. And the distance from one end of the galaxy to another, our little galaxy to another, would be a stack of paper 310 miles high. And our galaxy is just a speck in the universe. And Hebrews ver chapter 1, verse 3 says that Jesus Christ holds the universe together with the word of his power. You don't invite someone like that into your life and then tell them what to do or how things are going to be. Jesus Christ holds the universe together with the word of his power. He defines the universe, and if he is that big and that powerful, then he can define for us what holiness looks like whether it lines up with what we want or not, whether it feels comfortable or safe or not. When we are consumed by God, his love, with passion and worship, we are made holy as he is holy through the continuous refining work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So how does he do it? He is holy, and so he defines that holiness for us. He, he wants us to be like him, but how does he accomplish that in our lives? What does that, ver what does that work look like? If we jump back to verse 5, the author of Hebrews says, Have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? He said, and here he references Proverbs chapter 3, 11, and 12, My child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline, and don't give up when he corrects you, for the Lord disciplines those he loves. And he punishes each one he accepts as his child. As you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Who ever heard of a child who isn't disciplined by his father? If God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means that you're illegitimate and not really his children at all. Since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the father of our spirits and live forever ever? for our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how, 
but God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. No discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. It's painful, but afterwards there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. The way that he refines us is through discipline. We use that word discipline. The author uses that word a lot in that passage. And before you get a freak, all freaked out, there, there's something that it's important to understand here too. Um, when I hear the word discipline, I automatically think of punishment. You're being disciplined for something you did wrong. You're being punished for something that you did wrong. But that's only part of discipline in this context. Discipline is used here as a much more comprehensive term, not specifically meant to mean punishment. The word uh, that the author uses is paideia, which means educating and training the body and the mind. It was a comprehensive system of training, not punishment. We can talk about this the same way that we talk about someone being a disciplined athlete. Exercise and physical discipline is hard, and it feels uncomfortable, uh, and it's hard on the body sometimes, but we would never say a disciplined athlete is punishing themselves for something or, or being punished for something. They're dedicated, they're training, they're exercising, they're following the specific regimen because they have a goal in mind. If we talk about someone being a disciplined person, it's not a pejorative term, it just means that they have their stuff together, they know what they want, they have their life in order. Uh, it doesn't, though, it doesn't never mean punishment. When we sin, there are consequences for our sin, and sometimes God lets us suffer those consequences to help us to learn, to call us out of our sin, to encourage us to repent because he loves us, and he wants what's best for us. He defines what holiness is and what it looks like in our lives, and he works to teach us, to train us, to correct us in order to produce holiness in us because he is a good and loving father, and he has eternity in mind. Verse 11 uh, in the New International Version says, No discipline at the time is pleasant, but later on for those who have been trained by it, it produces a harvest of peace and righteousness. Exercise, I don't think, is fun. Um, if you're like a gym rat, you can argue with me about it, um, but it's not fun. You will never uh, see me sitting at home, uh, bored with nothing to do, and think, I should jump on the treadmill, won't that be a blast? Um, I will never like join an exercise class just for kicks, but when I exercise, there are benefits to my body. I, it produces the harvest of less high blood pressure and less risk of heart attack and stroke. It's not fun. I don't enjoy it, but it's good for me in the long run. Uh, my mom, <laughs> when I was a kid, hi, mom. She's watching because uh, it's Mother's Day. Um, uh, my mom, when I was a kid, she would tell me to clean my room, um, and I was a real, real slob when I was a kid. Um, and she would ask me to clean my room, and I wouldn't say no, but I wouldn't do it, and I would put it off, and I would put it off, and she would ask me again, and she would ask me again, and I would put it off, and I would put it off, and finally, she would get fed up, and she would say, all right, Cal, um, no TV until your room's clean, or you can't go to your friend's house like you were planning to until your room's clean, and then I would clean my room, um, probably with some huffing and puffing and sighing. Uh, but she wasn't doing that because it was fun for me. I didn't have a good time. And I can tell you, having raised a few children, that she definitely wasn't doing it because it was fun for her. It was not fun for her at all, I'm sure. But she did it because she had the end in sight. She wanted me to grow up to be a person who could take care of their stuff and keep after themselves. She wasn't trying to give me a hard time. She was doing it because she loved me. And she didn't want me to grow up to be such a slob. God knows that when he corrects us, it's for our good. He knows that when he stretches us, when he exercises us, it's for our good. It might not be pleasant in the moment, but he has our earthly good in mind here, but also our eternal good in mind. His teaching, his correction, his discipline, his refining in us is for our good and will produce holiness in us, even if it's difficult or painful at the time. So God defines what holiness looks like, and he teaches us holiness in our lives. He exercises us. He disciplines us. He corrects us when he needs to. How does he do those two things? There, there's two ways. Um, the first way that, that we see him uh, refining us is he just calls us out. 
when there's sin in our lives, something in our lives that doesn't honor him, he'll call it out in us. When there's something in our lives that doesn't line up with his standard of holiness, he'll point that out and ask us to give that over to him, to confess, to repent, and to surrender that to his authority and to his control. He'll call it out. Sometimes those things are obvious outright sins, things that we're doing that break God's law. And sometimes they're not so obvious. Sometimes the things he calls out in us are bad habits that we're giving priority to. Sometimes it's an attitude that we're holding on to. Sometimes it's a relationship that's not honoring him. He will ask for anything that is keeping us from experiencing the fullness of relationship with him. And sometimes it's a relief to surrender those things, to give those things up because they've been weighing us down. And sometimes they feel like good things and they're hard to give up. We like them. There's a reason that we're doing them. It feels hard. But God refines us and he makes us holy by calling those things out in us and asking us to surrender them to him. They might leave a hole, but he'll fill it with more of his presence, his spirit, his love, his peace, his joy. He calls things out in us that he wants us to give over to him. And the second way that he refines us, he can use anything, um, but the second way that he, he really refines us is through difficulty, through hardship. When we go through hard things, the Holy Spirit refines us. Hear me very clearly on this. I'm not saying at all that God causes all the bad things to happen in our lives and that when bad things happen, they're directly from God. What I am saying is that God can use and wants to use everything to bring us closer to him. He can redeem the worst of situations and use it to help shape us, to bring us closer to him. Sometimes he uses difficult people in our lives. There are people that drive us nuts and we have to learn patience. Sometimes he uses situations that just stretch our patience, hardships. Sometimes he uses pain. Sometimes he uses grief. Sometimes he uses loss. Sometimes he uses sadness. Cory Ten Boom was a, a Dutch woman who lost her father and sister um, in a concentration camp, but she herself survived two different ones. And she said, you, never, you may never know that Christ is all you need until Christ is all you have. The difficulties that we face help us learn to trust God more deeply. They draw us closer to him because we need to depend on him because he is all we have. That's why James says, in the very beginning of his letter, he says, Brothers and sisters, consider it pure joy whenever you face troubles or temptations of any kind. What kind of weirdo <laughs> says be joyful when you face suffering, when you face trials? What kind of weirdo says that? The kind of weirdo that knows that God can use even the worst situations and use them to bring us closer to him, to redeem them and bring beauty from the ashes. We talked a couple of weeks ago uh, about a potter shaping a clay pot on a wheel, and it starts out like a small lump, and, and they pull it, and they stretch it beyond its capacity. And as it, as it gets pulled and stretched, it expands, and its capacity gets bigger and bigger. And when we are stretched, through difficulty, when we are pulled out of what is comfortable or safe, our capacity for love, for trust, for joy, for peace is expanded. And we are expanded, and there is more room for God to fill us up with more and more of himself. He refines us by calling things out in us, and he refines us through the hard stuff that we go through. A forest fire seems like a devastating and bad thing. If you see pictures of forest fires on the news, everything is just gone. It's consumed. But for the forest itself, fire is a catalyst for growth and for new life. Fire is considered to be as crucial for forest renewal as sun and as rain. It burns away what's dead and what's dying, and it uh, clears the way for more sun to get into the ground and it releases nutrients into the soil. There are some kinds of trees that will only release their seeds when they're exposed to the heat of fire. A forest fire consumes everything around it, but it refines 
It makes way for new and healthy growth. And when we encounter the Holy Spirit, his refining fire burns away what's unnecessary. He burns away what's old and dead and keeping us from a full relationship with God and makes way for what's new and healthy. We're at the very beginning of of Hebrews now, uh, and I want to read the first couple of verses. The author of Hebrews says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses, let let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. And now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. The beauty of all of this is whatever you're being asked to do, whatever situation you might be facing, Jesus knows. Jesus knows. He knows what it is to face temptation to sin. He knows what it's like to have to deal with people who hurt and betray you. He knows what it is to face difficulty, to be hungry. He knows what it is to be sick, to experience anguish and anxiety. That same holy God we see in the Old Testament who appeared in smoke and thunder and who holds the universe together with the word of his power doesn't ask you to walk through anything that he hasn't walked through himself. That thing that he's asking you to let go of, it might be scary, it might be painful, but God is good and you can trust him. That difficult, stressful, hard situation that you're stuck in the middle of, it might seem absolutely overwhelming, but God is good, and you can trust that he will take that pain and bring beauty from the ashes. God has the long game in mind. He sees beyond the forest fire to the growth and the change that will happen after, and beyond that to the eternity that we'll get to spend with him. I'm going to ask the band to come back up, if you would. Um... And we're going to take a couple of minutes and just listen. Last week we listened uh, and we asked God to give us an experience of his love. And this week I want to challenge you to listen to what the Holy Spirit might be saying to you and to how he might want to refine you. Maybe you've been trying to fit God uh, into your agenda, into what you think your holiness should look like. Um, And maybe you need to let go of that and look at his holiness and pattern your life after his holiness. Maybe, that there, maybe, there's, um, maybe there's something in your life that, that you know is, is sin, and you don't really want to give up. You don't really want to let go of, but you felt the Holy Spirit just gently prodding you about it and calling, calling it out. And if you have something uh, that, that he's calling out in you, and you need to confess that, you can just go ahead and do it in your heart. You don't have to say anything out loud. Sometimes that's a really great way, though, to experience freedom, is to say it out loud to someone else. I mean, you don't have to, like, do it right now, right here, but find somebody after that you love and you trust. Maybe you're just in the middle of it. You're in the middle of a really hard, really impossible, really terrible situation, and you don't really know what God is doing or what he wants to do or how he could possibly redeem it. And so maybe the next few minutes you can just ask him to show you what he's doing, how he wants to change you. And just maybe to give you a a fresh sense of his presence with you in the middle of it. If you need some guidance uh, for how to pray, Psalm 139 offers a great prayer in verses 23 and 24. Um, And I'm going to pray this over us, and you can pray along with me in your heart, and then just take some time while we sing this next song to listen to what God might be saying to you. Search me, O God, and know my heart. 
Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything that offends you and lead me in the way of everlasting life. Amen.